Okay, so uh, welcome to the uh, last uh, session of the day before the reception. We have uh, two wonderful talks one on reinforcement learning, one on efficient reinforcement learning and one on safe reinforcement learning. So the first talk will be given by Emma Bronsko from Stanford University who will talk to us about efficient reinforcement learning when data are costly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. It's an incredible turnout, and I think it's an amazing time to be thinking about these sorts of questions. So as a society, we often ask many sorts of interventional questions, like what's the best way to teach a student coding? Um, how should we treat a particular patient for cancer? Um, or is job training going to increase future income? And while maybe 100 or 200 years ago, we might have approached these questions through hunches or our own intuition or perhaps personal anecdotes, um, at least over the last 50 years, we've moved to a much more scientific approach to trying to answer these questions. And the rise of things like uh, evidence-based medicine is this sort of approach to thinking about interventional science where what we want to do is to be able to answer these really important societal questions through the scientific method. So if we think about how science would guide us to try to answer these questions, the typical scientific method is to think about perhaps a particular intervention and then taking two different groups, often known now as an A-B test, and seeing which intervention works well. So if I was to take a classic scientific experiment to try to, for example, answer which way we should teach students so that we can maximize their graduation rate from a weekend boot camp on coding, for example. Um, perhaps I have two different ways of teaching students during this boot camp. Um, maybe one's more interactive, one's less interactive. And I look at my standard scientific methods and I do a power analysis and it says, you're gonna need 50 people in each group to figure out whether or not intervention A or intervention B is more effective. So I run my experiment, um, and I get something like this, where I observe that intervention A seems to be allowing many more people to graduate from this boot camp, and intervention B is not quite so successful. And so if I look about this sort of standard scientific approach to answering this question, I might get something where I see that in this particular group, um, I've had 46 students um, manage to graduate from intervention A, and only six graduate from intervention B. Now, this is unfortunate because these are real students, um, and so you might hope that we could have figured out earlier that intervention A is in fact much more effective at helping students graduate. So let's imagine an alternative world where we can do something like the following, where we have students enrolling in this online boot camp over time, and so we can be looking at which of these two interventions seems to be most effective at impacting graduation rates. <laughs> And so if we could do this, then we could look at something like the following and observe that even after perhaps the first cohort of students to go through this boot camp, um, that the students who are in intervention A seem to be graduating at a much higher rate. And so if we could dynamically adapt how we assign students to conditions, uh, if we could do sort of a continually improving system, we might expect to see something like the following, where instead of having to allocate equal groups of students to both interventions in advance, like what we do in classic science experiments, that we could have something that looks more like the following, where we have many, many more students graduating. And if we compare this to the classic scientific experiment, where perhaps in that scenario we only had 46 graduates, then now we have this new paradigm which would allow us to have 87 students graduate. So this is a simulated example. Um, but this should, of course, for many of you, start to sound very familiar in terms of things like optimal control and reinforcement learning, where we can actually adapt how we make decisions over time in order to maximize outcomes. So reinforcement learning is the background that I come to for this problem, and it is exactly on this question of how we can learn from experience in order to make good decisions to maximize desired outcomes. Now historically, and certainly from when I was in graduate school, the primary testbed of reinforcement learning systems um, was robotics and simulations. And we've heard a lot about both of those types of scenarios today already. Um, and there's been some incredible successes and continue to be some incredible successes of these paradigms. I just want to point out why these paradigms have been so popular for reinforcement learning and also for controls. And it is because these sorts of paradigms allow us to act. So you could argue that the last 20 years of machine learning has mostly focused on prediction because that is where we could get data. So we could get data that would allow us to predict decisions about you know, whether something's a face or not. What we couldn't necessarily do is act in the world. But you can act if you have a robot or you have a drone. 
Now, I think what's changing right now, one of the really huge opportunities I see going forward, is that we now both have massive compute, massive sensors, and many, many ways to interact with people um, continually, sometimes for negative outcomes, as we've seen, um, as well known in the news now, um, but also for positive outcomes. And so that we can have interactions that are helping people learn better or helping them manage their wellness, um, and that we can try to be adapting those interactions over time so that we can now use reinforcement learning as a paradigm to try to impact all these really important societal questions that we'd like to try to benefit people. And so a lot of the work that we've done in my lab is really to think about techniques to minimize and understand what data is needed in order to learn to make good decisions. And all of this is with a sort of underlying paradigm that if we could learn to make good decisions faster, we could benefit more people. That's why sample efficiency is important to me. So when we think about doing this, there's two sort of classic problems that come up um, in reinforcement learning. And I'll talk briefly today about uh, the work that my lab has been doing, both on exploration and counterfactual reasoning. So this is an early example of some way we were thinking about exploration. Um, this is a game called Battleship Numberline. It's a fractions game. I'm happy to talk offline about why fractions is a particularly important skill that many Americans and many other students struggle with. Um, and what you could see in this little video is the student was trying to learn where to um, understand where the fraction one half is, and then they had to try to um, target that on the number line, and if they got it correct, they would um, sink a battleship. Now, when you think about this game, there's a lot of hyperparameters to try to tune in it in order to keep people engaged in learning. So just like in many of our deep neural networks, um, there are lots of parameters. And to my knowledge, this is the first example of using multi-armed bandits to significantly reduce how much data we need in order to learn what is most effective. So the parameters here are things like how big are the ship, whether or not um, you show gamification, um, whether there's music, there's a whole bunch of different types of parameters that we could try to optimize online in real time. Um, and so in this case, we use multi-armed bandits in order to figure out how could we much more quickly figure out what was effective for student learning and engagement. Now, this sort of makes it sound like it might be a trivial problem to solve. How could we do you know, this sort of exploration? How can we effectively gather data? Um, but in fact, this is an extremely hard problem that we've been struggling with for at least 60 years. So I kind of love this quote from Wikipedia about bandits. Um, it was something that I didn't know before a few years ago, which is some of the first knowledge of multi-armed bandits came up uh, during World War II, and the Allied scientists were working on this problem. And they decided it was so hard that they should definitely share it with Germany so all of us could waste our time. So this is a really hard problem. You know, how do we effectively gather data online to figure out what works? Um, and this has been a problem we've been struggling with for many, many years. And yet we have some really nice existence proofs that some people or some agents, intelligent agents, hopefully most of the time, are able to do it, which is humans. So if you look at how people learn to play video games, um, on the x-axis here, we sort of see sort of the equivalent of the amount of experience for DDQN, which is one of sort of up to fairly recently a state-of-the-art reinforcement learning machine uh, approach. And what you can see is sort of the points achieved by people. And you can see that they're doing very well. And if you compare that to how machines are doing, they're doing very poorly. Now, the reason why we have the x-axis here is that, of course, machines are learning from scratch, at least in this domain, and so they have to understand vision. So one of the hypotheses where, well, maybe the, the computer just needs to learn how to understand vision, and once they do that, then they're gonna learn as fast as people. But what this graph demonstrates is that that is not the case, um, and it's not just that it's not the case for one particular game, it's not the case for many types of games. And so the hypothesis put forth from um, Sam Gershman and Josh Tenenbaum's lab um, here at Harvard and MIT was that people are much more strategic in their exploration. We are much more strategic in how we gather data in order to learn to make good decisions. So we are very interested in understanding this formally and also in understanding when is it hard to learn to make good decisions um, because it's clear that different types of problems may be easier or harder. So we decided to tackle this in the context of tabular episodic reinforcement learning. There's a lot of really wonderful work that's happened in contextual um, multi-armed bandits and multi-armed bandits in general. Um, but the problem in tabular episodic RL has been sort of a challenge in the reinforcement learning community since about the late 90s. And one way to quantify performance in this case formally is regret. So we can look at, 
If we have an episodic system, which means that we're going to act for eight steps and then be reset to some starting distribution and act again for eight steps, um, what is our performance in each episode and how does that compare to the optimal performance? So what we do when we quantify regret formally is we just sum up the difference between how well our algorithm is doing and how well it could have done. And when you sum that over time, that's showing you how your regret is growing or how far from optimal you are. So how do classic approaches work? Well, classic approaches, like the one I showed you before, DDQN, um, is non-strategic in its exploration. So what it does is it basically looks at its prior evidence of what seems to have worked well in the past or not. It uses that in order to often do either dynamic programming or temporal difference learning um, based on that experience, plus a small amount of randomization. And that small amount of randomization allows it to sort of learn about things that might not have looked really effective so far. The problem with this is that it can fail. So if you do non-strategic RL, it can fail um, in certain environments. Uh, what that means is that our regret can grow linearly with the number of time steps. In other words, we can just make bad decisions forever. So some of the intuition for why you know, exploration can be so hard um, comes from the following. There's a classic small domain called Chain. Um, just curious, has, who here has heard about it? I know it's mostly a controls audience, but who here has heard of Chain before? OK, so a few people. Um, uh, just uh, as a refresher and introduction, chain is sort of a tiny Markov decision process. Um, there's only two actions, and there's um, a finite number of states. And what you can see here is that you always start on the left-hand side, the left-hand state. Um, and there's a small positive reward for staying in that state. And then all the way over at the other edge of the chain um, is a, a relatively larger reward. And so the optimal action is to try to go all the way to the right-hand side of the chain and get that optimal reward. But you don't get it until you get all the way there. Another way to think about chain is it's something like a combination lock. You don't get the solution, you can't open the lock until you do all the right decisions. So that means that algorithms that tend to do random exploration tend to fail in this domain um, or need an extraordinary amount of experience in order to learn to make good decisions. Because if you do random permutations here, they're not gonna lead you to the goal. And in fact, because there's sort of this local distractor reward, you're gonna be tempted to stay local based on your experience so far. So this is sort of a classic domain that's come up in reinforcement learning to illustrate why exploration can be needed in some cases and why simple strategies for exploration can fail. So what might be a better approach to, exper um, to exploration? Well, another approach is to directly think about our model uncertainty um, given the finite data. So if we've only you know, tried out different strategies, different ways of teaching students online, for example, for a small amount of students, then we have a lot of uncertainty over our dynamics model, our reward model, and our value functions. And if we model these explicitly, then we can try to explore relative to this uncertainty. So in particular, one of the key principles that's come up over the last two decades is optimism under uncertainty. Um, which I love as a life principle as well as an algorithmic idea. So, so the idea in this case is that we can think formally about the uh, uncertainty we have of our models, and then we act optimistically with respect to that uncertainty. So in this case, it's like the agent is thinking about all the best possible outcomes that are consistent with the data. And then it acts according to those best possible outcomes. So it turns out this fairly simple idea can give us a huge amount of benefit in terms of strategic exploration. And over the last couple decades, um, we've sort of been making substantial progress on showing that we can get much, much better regret bounds, meaning that we can make decisions much, much faster um, and much better decisions faster than what is possible if we do simple exploration. And recently, um, uh, in ICML, in a couple of weeks, we're going to provide uh, the first uh, type pack bounds, um, as well as match existing type regret bounds for this scenario. So in some ways, you can say that sort of in the, the dominant order, um, episodic tabular reinforcement learning is sort of closed now from this perspective. But now we understand how to act in these domains, and we understand the boundaries of what, um, you know, how much evidence is needed in order to learn to make a dis good decision. So you might think, well, maybe that's case closed, but um, uh, that's not the case. Uh, let's look at this particular example. This is an example from Mark Bellamer's work. Um, uh, one of these, so this is two different Atari games, um, and one of these is using a form of strategic exploration. It's doing some form of optimism under uncertainty, um, and one algorithm is not. And I purposely hid the legend here because if you look at these two plots, these are two different games with two different algorithms. One is optimism, one is not. Um, 
they look basically identical. Um, it's not at all clear here that you need to do any form of strategic exploration. And so I think that highlights the issue that even though no, these bounds are for the worst case, in the worst case, exploring and make, learning to make good decisions can be really hard, it turns out that there are many, many domains where it's not that hard. And this is known formally. So if you're in the case of things like deterministic systems, um, or if you're in the case of multi-armed bandits, which can be thought of as a subcases of reinforcement learning, it is known that there are better theoretical results for these particular subcases. But the challenge here is that that means that you have to know you're in one of those subcases. And normally, the environment doesn't come up to you and say, hey, I'm definitely a bandit, or I'm definitely a deterministic system. Often, you're not going to know what that is until you start to explore in that environment, or you start to try things out with customers, or patients, or students. Um, and I would like it if people can use our algorithms without having a PhD in reinforcement learning or controls. So it means that we're going to need to have algorithms that can adapt to the structure that is present without requiring the domain expert to know whether that structure is there. So another ICML paper that we have coming out this summer is looking at having instant dependent bounds with a generic algorithm. And what that means is that I want to have an algorithm that can adjust to the structure and provably better, be better if there is structure in the domain, but I don't have to provide that structure in advance. And I think one of the interesting things about this is it helps us to characterize when problems are hard. So in particular, two quantities that turn out to be very useful to think about um, whether problems are hard or not is the variance of the next state value, meaning that on the next state, if you're in a particular state and you transition, what is the variance in the value function on that next state, as well as just what is the sum of possible rewards you could ever get in this domain. So our main result in this case is a new regret bound that depends on these two quantities um, and but without having to know what those quantities are. So the insight here is that we're still going to be able to get uh, very strong regret bounds in terms of the worst case, but we can do substantially better in many other cases. I'll just say briefly to give some intuition about why. Um, the intuition is, is that historically we tried to use sort of confidence bounds over the dynamics model parameters. So the same sort of parameters you'd get if you were looking at sort of standard machine learning, not decision making. And the insight that's been pretty powerful over the last five years is to think about having new types of confidence bounds that directly think about value instead of just models. Um, and that by doing that, and in particular thinking about variance of the value function, we can do much better than what was possible previously. I'll skip through some of that kind of fast. Um, but the intuition is that even though we don't know this variance of the value function, we can estimate it online um, very quickly, and that ends up giving us a benefit. So what does that allow us to do? So if we go back to that classic sort of chain example, which has been used many times um, in reinforcement learning to indicate why we need hard, you know, why exploration is hard and why we're going to need all this data to learn in these hard cases, um, it turns out that this new form of sort of problem-dependent bound allows us to show that this problem isn't nearly as hard as what you might think. Because if you look at what the quantity is in terms of the variance of the value function for this type of domain, it turns out to be much smaller than you'd expect. And so if we compare our results to what was previously known, our result is here on the right-hand side. It shows that we're going to grow roughly with square root of t compared to these prior approaches that square, uh, grew with the size of the state space or, or the, the horizon. It also gives us insight into generally what's hard to learn. Um, turns out both deterministic problems or really stochastic problems like bandits are both fairly easy to learn in. The hard cases was when you're in the middle. It also allows us to answer a recently posed open question at Colt about whether or not long horizon problems are strictly harder than short horizon. And we can say, under their framework, no, it's, um, it's not harder to lo learn in long horizon problems. Um, since Ben Recht is in the audience um, and we were just chatting recently, I'll also mention briefly that we've extended this result also to when you have gap dependence, which is a common structure that you see in bandit problems but hasn't been explored formally in the reinforcement learning setting until um, recently, some very nice work from Kevin Jameson over at UW, and also we have some parallel work. So to just summarize this, I think this sort of work is giving us insights into when is it hard to learn to make good decisions, at least in small tabular cases, um, and when is it not? And can we have algorithms that are going to adjust to the structure of the domain? There's a huge number of open questions here. We really want to scale up to much more complicated state spaces and complicated dynamics. Um, but I think it's very helpful to sort of build up the foundation so that we understand formally some of the smaller settings before we scale. So 
I next want to talk briefly about counterfactual reasoning, which is essentially saying, how can we use the old data we have in the best way possible, again, to try to make good decisions quickly? So this came up when we were about five years ago when I was collaborating with Zoran Popovich over at University of Washington. Um, I'll play that again because it goes kind of fast. This is a game called Refraction. It's been played by about 500,000 students, and it teaches people fractions. And what students have to do here is they have to split laser beams in order to feed spaceships, and the way they split them has to do with fractions. And so what we wanted to do in this case is leverage semi-randomized data and figure out how we should be providing levels to students in order to help them learn and persist. And the nice thing that we found is by doing sort of counterfactual or off-policy reinforcement learning, um, we could find a policy that was much, much better, that was about 30% better in terms of persistence um, than was previously possible. And so I think that illustrates why there may be an enormous gap of how we're currently using our old data and how we could be using our old data in order to make better decisions. So in particular, we've been doing a lot of work on batch off-policy evaluation, which is the question of you have this old data, you have a new potential strategy you want to try um, that's different than what you use to collect the data. Can you estimate its value? This is more generally the question of sort of causal inference and counterfactual reasoning. And there's been a huge body of literature in this and things like epidem epidemiology and statistics and biostatistics. Um, and there's increasing interest in this in the reinforcement learning and machine learning community. Now, most of this work is focused on when you just have a single binary decision, often called treatment effect estimation. But of course, in many cases, we're making a sequence of decisions, not just one. Now, that should naturally sound like a great place for, to use reinforcement learning or controls. The problem is, is that it's well known since the 1990s from some work from uh, John Tzitziklis and Ben Van Roy and other people that um, once we combine off-policy learning with reinforcement learning, we can often get very unstable estimates. And the reason for this is that when you have different policies, you're going to take different actions. And if you have different actions, you're going to get different states. So it's sort of this challenge of covariate shift that Anka was talking about recently as well, that we're just going to have different distributions of data, and we need to account for that. So there's many different ways to try to do this. Um, one way is to build sort of dynamics models that we could use. The problem with that is they typically tend to be biased, so they can have low variance. Another approach is to use things like importance sampling, um, which has zero bias under some conditions, uh, but high variance. And of course, you could imagine bringing these two ideas together. And so this is an idea that came out from statistics of things like doubly robust estimators to try to get better estimates of how good it would be if we try out a new strategy before we actually try it. And these ideas were brought over to sort of the multi-arm banded and reinforcement learning community in kind of 2011 and 2016. But the insight that we had in my group was to say, well, you know, we think about bias and variance, and really what we often want to do is to combine between both of those. What we really want is good estimates of a policy before we deploy it so we can know whether or not we're going to run it. And so a natural idea is how do we sort of combine between these different forms of estimators in a way that's going to allow us to get good estimates of the value of a policy. So this is work with my former postdoc, Phil Thomas. The idea is that we can blend between these different estimates. So you could do something like um, estimate one step with a model and most steps um, uh, with, or one step with important sampling, most steps with a model, and that would be low variance but high bias. Um, or you could sort of trade this off in terms of how much you're using your model versus how much you're using um, important sampling. And what we ended up doing is phrasing this sort of directly as a quadratic program, where we think about weighting these different forms of estimates in order to try to directly minimize the mean squared error. These have some nice statistical properties. They're, they're unbiased. Um, but perhaps most significantly in terms of the point that I want to make today, they can be way, way, way more data efficient. So it doesn't really matter exactly all the other lines I'm plotting on here. The main thing that matters is that the x-axis is amount of data. So you can think of this as number of students. And what you can see is our approach called magic um, is uh, for about requiring about a tenth amount of data to get the same accuracy of estimate. Now, this is a small simulated domain. This won't necessarily be the same in all types of applications. But the important thing here is that by sort of having, creating better statistical estimators, we could need less data to figure out what works. Now, we're using this similar sort of idea of saying, how can we think very directly about getting a good estimate of how a policy would work to try to build different forms of dynamics models? 
So together with my students and Finale Joshi Belez at Harvard students, we're thinking about this for healthcare applications. So how can we build better dynamics models to explain things like HIV treatment regulation or other cases where we can try to, again, combine between these different forms of models that have different forms of bias um, and variants uh, in order to get better estimators. And we're also looking at this for doing offline learning of better policies. So one thing that's been sort of a, a continuing challenge in the um, general reinforcement learning community and deep reinforcement learning community is policy search methods are um, very popular, but using off-policy data has often been a really big struggle. And so we have a new paper coming out at UAI showing that we can actually leverage off-policy data very efficiently. Um, by, again, really focusing on getting better estimates of the evaluation so that compared to sort of here, the red line is showing you what if you just use the data that you have um, in a standard way. And what we're saying by using that exact same data, which has this awful policy, this red policy, um, we can get our orange line. So just exactly same data, but just like a better method of using that to do off policy um, actor critic. Um, and this has been a really large focus of our lab over the last few years. So I think that the, the potential of better leveraging the existing data we have, which is exactly an opportunity when we think about these societally facing applications like education and healthcare, is somewhere where I see a huge amount of growth potential for machine learning and controls. So just to summarize, um, in my group, I'm really interested in how we can sort of really effectively learn um, what works and why it's hard to learn to make good decisions. I think that exploration and counterfactual reasoning are two of the keys for that. Um, and one of the things I'm really excited about going forward is how do we sort of combine these two insights? Um, how do we better leverage the prior data in an online learning setting? Because I think if we can do this, we could substantially benefit a lot more people. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for a few questions. I cannot see. Yeah, there is a question. Oh. Hey. hey, thank you for the talk. So, just a very quick question. So, what is the regret? difference between your regret bound and uh, Azar et al? Great question. The question was, what's the difference between my regret bound and Azar and all? Azar and all has an additional lower bound that depends on T, um, whereas ours is tight um, in the terms that depend on T, both for the upper and lower bound. Okay. Any other questions? I guess it's a so let's thank Emma one last time. Thank you. Thank you.